in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was bang. <laughs> big bang. Before the Big Bang, there was nothing. There wasn't any space. No place to put anything. <laughs> Actually, the scientists say that there was something. There was a tiny particle, smaller than an atom, a singularity, a little dot. And inside of that dot was you and me and the entire universe. Or at least, Inside that dot was everything necessary to create you and me in the entire universe. And so it came to pass, 15 billion years ago today, <laughs> that tiny dot exploded. And out of that dot, smaller than an atom, came space, enough space to contain an entire universe. Out of that dot came time, enough time for a universe to be born, grow old, and die. Out of that dot came all of the elementary particles and forces, and they began mixing and combining and changing, and eventually creating all of the great galaxies full of suns and planets and the earth and all the forests and mountains and seas and people and cars, and bicycles, and dirty socks. All of it came out of that tiny particle, much smaller than an atom, and that explosion. And at some particular moment in this great expansion of this space-time universe is where we are right now, at this moment. Still big banging away. If I move my hand, if you walk, that's the energy of the big bang. Right now inside your brain, there are millions of synapses firing, we hope. <laughs> that is the energy of the big bang trying to understand the big bang. Here's an image. One trillionth of a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang, the universe was three feet in diameter. Now, you can get your mind around a universe like that, you know? <laughs> now, the latest estimate is the universe is 10 billion trillion trillion cubic light years large. Sounds about right to me. <laughs> and here we are, trying to figure out what we're doing here, what it's all about. But there's one thing we know for sure in the immensity of this 10 billion trillion trillion cubic light year universe, we are very important. April Fools! <laughs> That's what we're here to celebrate tonight, April Fool's Day. Celebrate our foolishness. Humans, put on your dunce caps, slap on a silly grin. It's time to celebrate April Fool's Day, which should be our most important and universal holy day because it honors all humanity, regardless of race, nationality, or religion. <laughs> As any fool can see, Lord, what fools these mortals be. And this is Scoop Nisker with the lowdown and far out. All we have to do is see, to see a fool is look in the mirror and check out the mid-sized mammal reflected there. A self-conscious ape who is driven by instincts we barely understand. Each of us feeling ourselves to be the center of the universe, so full of purpose and importance, trying hard to look dignified in spite of our protruding ears and noses. And then look closer in the mirror and notice the outline of the skull and remember that in the end the joke's on all of us. And on this first April Fool's Day of the George W. Bush administration, 
we are called upon to offer a special award to President Bush for actions beyond the call of foolishness, <laughs> actions which make him eligible for the title of complete idiot, <laughs> such as the President's decision to restrict U.S. aid to family planning clinics around the world, because what is certain to make everything worse and everyone more miserable is more people. After all, everybody's got problems. So, the more people there are, the more problems there will be. <laughs> it's so obvious you'd have to be either a politician or a pope not to figure it out. <laughs> Besides, it's starting to look like maybe we got God's original instructions wrong, and what he really said was, go forth and add. Another reason for giving Bush the Complete Idiot Award is his insistence on building a Star Wars missile defense. And the question remains, who are we defending ourselves against? Maybe it's the Azerbaijanis, but more likely it's the North Koreans who recently developed a medium-range missile called the Nodong. <laughs> How can anyone be afraid of a missile called the Nodong? <laughs> Nodong, no problem! So come on, George, put all your anti-missiles back in your pants. <laughs> but President Bush deserves a very special idiot award, along with a nose tweak, a raspberry, and an ear twist for refusing to put restrictions on industrial carbon dioxide emissions and for refusing to support the Kyoto Treaty on greenhouse gases. And I wonder if his own children's children will be coughing and sweltering even as they curse him. It has become clear to most scientists in recent years that we are cooking ourselves. And perhaps the only question that remains is whether the ozone will disappear first and we will be microwaved, or the greenhouse gases will get us and we will be poached. <laughs> Would you like fries with that? <laughs> but of course, we all get April Fool's awards this year for moving faster and faster on the energy of caffeine and greed, for driving around in steel boxes that require fuel from the other side of the planet, for crazily consuming and dot-comming ourselves into a stupor, and all of it supposedly done in the pursuit of happiness. And in light of our foolishness, April Fool's Day should be turned into a major holiday with a whole weekend for public rituals, like a mass mooning of each other, <laughs> or a simultaneous worldwide forehead slapping ritual with a loud collective dope. Okay. <laughs> Let's do it together. Get your palms ready. Okay. Anyone who had any money in the NASDAQ, dope. All right. Anybody who thought that deregulating the energy companies was a good idea, dope. Anybody who thought that meditation would solve all their problems, dope. Everyone who believes that someday they will, quote, get it all together, dope. See how good it feels? <laughs> Every April Fool's Day, we should hold a mass public confession of our foolishness, admit that in spite of our powers of reasoning, we still can't figure out why we're alive. We can't seem to conquer death or even invent a noiseless Velcro. Our, <laughs> our, col our collective fool's confession will feel real good because once we admit we're fools, we can relax. We no longer have to live up to some ridiculously high standards of decorum and intelligence. As the great Taoist philosopher Chuang Tzu says, those who know they are fools are not the biggest fools. And this is Scoop Nisker suggesting that tomorrow you spend some time making funny faces at yourself in the mirror, admit you are a fool and rejoice, and remember if you don't like the news. <laughs> It really would. It really would be so much better if we didn't have such high standards for ourselves. You know, we call ourselves homo sapiens sapiens, twice knowing humans. Which I think we should just take to mean that we have to hear something at least twice before we get it. <laughs> and I think we could actually all forgive ourselves our foolishness if we would only admit that we're a bunch of animals. Now, I hope you weren't, aren't offended by being called animals. Let me assure you, all my best friends are animals. <laughs> That's the way our most eminent scientists classify us. 
They say we're animals because we're not plants or fungi, although some of us are borderline. <laughs> but we should be proud to be animals, you know? Part of that wonderful kingdom of beautifully arrayed creatures. But no, we're in denial. You can tell. Go to a supermarket or a restaurant. There's a sign in the window, no animals allowed. People walk right through. <laughs> we want to believe we came from some other realm. We don't want, you know, we didn't come from here. We came from some other realm, and we're just kind of using the Earth as a training planet, and then we're going to move on somewhere, you know? See, I can tell you all actually believe that. But, you know, maybe the universe wasn't made just for us. Maybe this planet wasn't made just for us. There's evidence, actually, that this planet was made for the bacteria. They are the most successful and oldest living beings. Right now, you have more bacteria inside your mouth than all the humans that ever lived on planet Earth. That's right. They have little houses and restaurants in there. They have whole civilizations in there. That some of them just celebrated their 350 millionth millennium. There is some speculation that the bacteria invented humans as a kind of moving feedlot. <laughs> you know, get room and board and a tour of the neighborhood. See, they have a secret. The, the bacteria and the single-celled organisms the secret of their success is the fact that they can reproduce just by dividing. They just get this little packet of DNA in their body, evenly distributed, and, and then they split. There I go, there I go. It's a lot more efficient means of reproduction than ours. They don't have to take each other out to dinner first. <laughs> and furthermore, these little single-celled organisms you know, they never die. They aren't programmed to grow old and die. Apparently, everything was going swimmingly back in the primal seas when some of these single-celled organisms started to get interested in sex. They started to be attracted to one another and combining, joining up together. Eventually, they started putting their little packets of DNA together with a packet of DNA from another little being and they put it into a little baby microbe, into another body. You can imagine the papa and mama microbe say, oh, isn't it cute? Look at it twitch. You know, it's a <laughs> you've seen those microbes under the microscope. Anyway, <laughs> there was a catch, however. Once mama and papa microbe got their DNA into another little body, they no longer had to stick around forever. So their bodies became programmed to grow old and die. So essentially, what it comes down to, some life traded sex for death. <laughs> now there's a choice for you. <laughs> Would you rather live forever without sex or have sex and die? <laughs> I'd rather live forever, but that's the answer I give at my age. In exchange for our complexity, we had to accept mortality. To be human, we have to accept death. I think it'd be kind of fun, actually, to divide. I, I think dividing would be a great means of, of reproduction. And it, it was, since it was a, a means of reproduction, maybe it felt good like sex. The microbes aren't talking, you know. Uh, and it might be a little traumatic to think of losing one half of myself but it would also maybe double my chances for a happy life. <laughs> have a good time, have a good time. <laughs> the upshot is that we humans should wait maybe a few million more years before we proclaim ourselves the reason for everything and the masters of all we survey. 99% of all the species that have ever lived on Earth are now extinct, and the most successful are the simplest. Now we've evolved. Uh, the scientists tell us that every living being on the planet has evolved from those single-celled organisms. 
The Victorians were shocked when they were told that their ancestors were the apes. Now they're telling us that our ancestors were germs. <laughs> the more we know, the littler we get. <laughs> but we've come a long way from a single-celled being to a being with a hundred trillion cells, that's us. And we are somewhat intelligent, we're kind of smart, we've figured out where we came from. We've traced our own species back to Australopithecus five million years ago, the first of our ancestors to come down from the trees and head for the local tavern. <laughs> Three million years ago, Homo habilis, the handyman. <laughs> so we know he wasn't Jewish. The handyman started standing upright more often, probably to fix a leaky roof or throw a rock at some moving protein. And handyman enjoyed standing up so much that before long, they were standing up all the time and became a whole new subspecies of human called Homo erectus, or upright human. And we're not talking morality here. Because once you stand upright, you know, the genitalia and breasts are right out in front for everyone to see. So no doubt the brassiere and the loincloth were invented soon after we stood up. <laughs> see, the four-leggeds never had to worry about that stuff because they're, you know. But the amazing thing about standing up is that it is a, it's a major step in evolution and it's associated with a rapid increase in our brain size. Now you'd think that standing up would cause our feet to swell instead, but <laughs> this is the theory. <laughs> this is the theory. Our hands and arms were freed up when we stood up to manipulate sticks and rocks and things, and it required a bigger brain to coordinate those more precise movements. And since most of us have always been right-handed, it was the left, left hemisphere of the brain that got the big workout. So, you know, it was like, okay, Close those fingers around the stick, all right? And now uh, push the opposable thumb up and, okay, so it's tight. Now don't let go, okay? Bring the stick up towards the mouth. Take the piece of meat, put it in the mouth, and that was the f learning how to use the fork or the stick. About two million years ago, Homo erectus started spreading out from Africa. We don't know why exactly, but probably to look for Chinese food. <laughs> at the time, at the time, Homo erectus had a brain only about half the size of ours today. Otherwise, he would have sent out for Chinese food. And then the brain kept growing. Over the last million years, the brain kept growing, probably because we got caught in a few ice ages and we had to think hard and fast in order to stay warm. Would have been a lot easier just to grow a heavy coat of fur, but no, we kept growing the brain. We learned how to build fires and eventually learned how to sit around them and tell stories about ourselves. Modern humans didn't show up until about 50,000 years ago with Cro-Magnon people, they started having burial rituals, making jewelry and masks. Obviously, having come into some kind of self-consciousness, full self-consciousness perhaps, and asking the big questions like, what are we doing here? And is there an afterlife? And if not, can we invent one real quick? <laughs> and now, all of a sudden, that was just a blink of an eye in evolutionary time, in biological time, 50,000 years ago. All of a sudden, here we are in the modern world. We can fly into space and see the planet from outer space. We can look inside of matter. We have floods of information about everything from evolution to, to all the cultures that have ever lived on Earth. We're all called upon to play multiple roles. Maybe we got too smart, too fast. 
it seems like our tool making ability is far surpassed, has far surpassed our wisdom. We can now support billions of people on this planet, but unfortunately we're all working with a brain that's essentially designed for hunter-gatherers, which explains our fascination with shopping. <laughs> it explains our intense accumulation desire. The trouble is we're accumulating ourselves into a corner. We're consuming ourselves into a corner. And it's particularly hard for a lot of us, and I can see who you are out there. A lot of us are baby boomers, born after World War II and born in America in this great affluent society. You were told you could have it all. The message was you can be anyone you want to be, and go anywhere you want to go, do anything you want to do, eat anything you want to eat, be, go, do, eat. You can be anything you want to be. Be the president of the USA or be bent any which way. Be a fool, be cool, be a somebody or nobody home. A contender or pretender to the throne, be a drone or the queen bee. Be a buyer, a seller, a singer or a teller of tales, a lifter of veils. Be a banker, a golfer, a wanker, a rolfer, a CEO, a CPA, an SOB, an MFA. Or you could really go far and be a rock and roll star. Or maybe you could even be a deity. Be God by God. Then you can be everyone you want to be simultaneously. Because you can be, you can own, you can eat, you can go, you can go, you can you can own anything you want to own. Own a house or three, maybe 20 TVs. Get a piece of the rock, why not own a whole block? You could even own a wilderness, and I guess a mountain could be yours, or a lake or an island. You could even own a country of your own, call it my land. Or simply buy the presidency. Own a thousand pair of shoes, any cure for the blues, buy the pills, the thrills, don't worry about the bills. Get a classic piece of art. An original rendition or a first edition of your favorite creation. And maybe you could even buy yourself a revelation or a standing ovation. Buy yourself a new start, a new part, a new nose, a new chin, a new heart, a new do, a new you. Because you can own anything you want to own. You can eat, you can go, you can eat. Yeah, you can eat anything you want to eat. You are the main man, high on the food chain man. You could eat high on the hog, eat the legs of the frog, eat the brains or the stomach, toes of any creature that you meet. And if you don't like their color, you can dye them before you fry them. And if you don't like their texture, you can get them tenderized before you bite into their thighs. Have some fauna, some flora, come on, have some more, have some fowl, have some fish, have another dish. You are the main man and American man. You can eat any cuisine on the planetary scene. Have some Japanese, some Javanese, some Indian, Armenian. Have fast food, hot food, raw food. You got food, so eat, eat, eat. And then go anywhere you want to go. You can go on vacation just to visit any nation. Take a notion, get in motion, and just go to the mountains or the prairies or the ocean white with foam. Leave home. You could go to Walla Walla, but I don't know why you'd want to. And you could go to Oaxaca or get a nice palapa in Hawaii or Fuji. But why not go to Fiji and go diving in the reefs? Or roll yourself a sleeve in Jamaica? Or take a nice safari to Nairobi or the Gobi? Or a trek to Mauna Loa or right up the Himalaya to Shambhala or Valhalla? Or go visit the Maori? Or go looking for Satori in Japan, man? But if you really, truly want it, you could travel to Nirvana. Go beyond the desires of this crazy creation. Get off the wheel of rebirth and reincarnation. Get off the wheel that keeps you 
going and eating and being and owning and going and eating and being and owning and going and beating and eating and owning. consumers <laughs> considering that we're part of all of life we may be consuming a little bit too much hello earthlings this is scoop here to let you know that our little blue green planet continues to spin madly around on its axis causing the creatures who live on the surface to get dizzy and bump into each other making news and here are some stories about life in the food chain and who's eating whom. We begin at the Environmental Protection Agency and the newly created Amphibian Crisis Committee, which is not about a plague of frogs. This committee monitors reports from around the world about frogs disappearing and frogs mutating, and they are not mutating into princes. Many scientists believe that frogs are getting too much sun due to vanishing ozone. And just consider the consequences of frogs disappearing. If there are fewer frogs, then there will be a lot more mosquitoes. If there are fewer frogs, then the snakes will have to slither into the suburbs to find new sources of food. And if there are fewer frogs, what will the French people do? As those New Age folks say, it's all connected. And some experts believe the frogs are an early warning system for all of us with skin. But let's take the deep ecology point of view, which asks us to value nature for its own sake, not just for how it affects humans. So we might try to see frogs as leading important froggy lives. They have good days, bad days, mothers, children. Remember, froggy went a courtin'. <laughs> but if you can't work up any feeling for the frogs, how about the birds? Biologists say that two-thirds of the bird species on Earth are in decline, including the canary, which isn't even in the coal mine anymore. Perhaps you might be distressed to learn that the number of songbirds in the United States has decreased by 75% since the 60s, taking their songs with them. Which brings us to the fact that we are now living through one of the biggest species die-offs in all of biological history. More species going extinct today at a faster rate than ever before. And the main reason seems to be the burgeoning human herds. We won't mention any names spreading across the planet and consuming everything in their path like a plague of very large locusts. The tragic results can be found on the endangered species list, which reads like a who's who of the animal world. All of our favorites from the TV nature shows are on the list. The lions, tigers, elephants, and gorillas, the jaguar, leopard, rhinoceros, many species of monkey. All of the animals of our fairy tales and mythologies are facing extinction the bears, the whales, and the wolves. All of the creatures of our dreams and our poetry are dying, many species of deer and parrot, the giant sable antelope, the giant armadillo, the Mongolian beaver, the Mexican bobcat, the American alligator, the Jamaican boa constrictor, 15 species of turtle, and the thin-spined porcupine. The endangered species list should be posted in public places, read aloud in churches and schools, updated regularly in newspapers. Maybe every time a particular species makes the list, we should put its picture on milk cartons like a missing child. Otherwise, how will we know? And every time a species is officially declared extinct, we should have a worldwide wake, a saying goodbye forever, and then put up a statue somewhere of this species that no longer exists on Earth. Maybe each of us should adopt an endangered species. Find a life form you feel fond of. See what you can do to save it from extinction. It's now or never, earthlings. Become lion-hearted, foxy. Howl for the wolf. Pray for the mantis. Stand up for the right to arm bears. <laughs> and ask not for whom the frog croaks. It croaks for thee.
And this is Scoop saying, if you don't like the news, go out and make some of your own. But take heart. Take heart. We can all take heart. We can take heart because the speed and greed era cannot last. It will not last. Either we will discipline ourselves and stop it, or nature will stop it for us. This org orgy of consumption that we are enjoying, you are enjoying it, aren't you? <laughs> will come to an end. All ways of life, all civilizations, all empires come to an end. They're impermanent, like everything else. You look back at history, you see empires rising and falling like waves of the ocean. Babylonian, Mesopotamian, Egyptian, Mayan, Aztec, Greek, Roman. Where are they now? Just ruins for people to climb on and take pictures of. More recently, we have the European empires, the French, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the British, all gone. The Brits, only a couple decades ago, were proud to say the sun never sets on the British Empire. Now it's just those few chilly little islands in the North Atlantic. The sun never even rises on the British Empire. <laughs> so now we have America. We now have America as the mother country of a great capitalist empire. We don't call ourselves an empire. We're too self-righteous for that. But make no mistake, we rule. And all empires seem to go through a very similar life cycle of birth, maturity, and then decay. The signs of the de decay are something like this. Very common. All empires show these signs, according to historical analysis. Bloated, overextended military. Wild swings in the economy. People from the colonies flooding into the mother country. Bureaucratic despotism, political corruption, declining morals, values. Sound familiar? The trouble is, usually when empires are starting to decline, they, they greedily and desperately hold on to their power and privilege. Now, what if America? trying to be the great nation that we set out to be in the beginning, decided that we could see the writing on the wall and we're going to go out gracefully. I have a plan. It came to me in meditation. It's not really my plan. It just channeled. <laughs> it's under the philosophy, the new political philosophy of Zen socialism. Zen as in letting go, socialism as in together, letting go together. Under a Zen socialist government, the U.S. would go to the United Nations and announce that we are resigning as a superpower. And from now on, we'd like to be known as an ordinary nation. It would feel so good. You know, it's not easy being a citizen of a superpower. You know, you've got to work real hard to keep up with everybody. And, and you got to have, you know, powerful defenses. It would feel real good. We could relax. And there's really nothing to fear. You know, Rome didn't decline in a day either. Rome disintegrated, and probably a lot of Ro Roman citizens didn't even notice it happened. And a few centuries later, they started calling themselves Italians, and they seem to be doing all right today. So why don't we, why don't we go, go out gracefully and set a standard for all empires to follow in the future? I think the government, under a, a Zen socialist government, would set out a kind of social program a, 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 uh, to help us ease our transition from superpower to ordinary nationhood. I envision it as the great leap backward. A five-year plan, the great leap backward. The government would set up work, public work programs like the, in the Roosevelt era, and like the New Deal, only this would be the New Age New Deal. So the government would set up a department of meditation and therapy and set up deprogramming centers around the country to teach hyperactive and overproductive workers how to become less productive members of a less productive society. 
we would, we would pay people by the hour just to work on themselves. <laughs> Industrial workers could be put to work on disassembly lines. <laughs> Take apart the cars, separate the steel back into ores, and shovel it all back in the ground again. <laughs> Take down the unnecessary parking lots and freeways. The Army Corps of Engineers could be put to work taking apart the dams, letting the rivers run free again. Under the great slogan, under the great ideal, making the world safe for nature. Maybe as we make our transition from superpower to ordinary nation, we could ask a country like India or Egypt to start a little Peace Corps in reverse and send us <laughs> volunteers, teach us how to wash our clothes on rocks, how to how to make tasty meals of rice and beans three times a day, and more important than anything, teach us how to take the siesta. Yes, that's what we need. And as we decline and slide, we'll call it the decline and slide since it's voluntary, we'll need to keep our currency afloat, and we'll need to earn some foreign revenue. So what do we do better than any other people on the planet? That's right. Entertain. We are the most entertaining nation on the planet, no question about it. So as we resign as a superpower, we will simultaneously announce that we are opening up the entire North American continent as a great theme park called Formerly Great America. <laughs> and invite the world Invite the world to come and see the first intentional decline and fall. <laughs> the advertising copy is already written. Come one, come all, see history in the making. Visit formerly great America. See the World Trade Center towers, soon to be the postmodern equivalent of the pyramids. Visit Atlantic City and Las Vegas in the final throes of their history-making decadence. Come visit the Chicago Board of Trade restaurant where the grain and livestock commodity ticker tapes have been turned into souvenir menus. Visit the great stadia where the athletes spar for glory and great riches. What a show we have for you. And the downhill rides are spectacular. The Statue of Liberty raises her torch to the world saying, give us your curious, your bored, your tourist money yearning to buy cheap. Come one, come all, to the next greatest show on earth, formerly Great America. If we put our minds to it, we can make it the most spectacular, ordinary country in the world. Chief Seattle, 1855. Tribe follows tribe and nation follows nation like the waves of the sea. It is the order of nations and regret is useless. Your time of decay may be distant, but it will surely come. For even the white man whose God walked and talked with him as friend with friend cannot be exempt from the common destiny. We may be brothers after all. We shall see. One more reason to take heart. Having big perspectives is very important in these times, in all times. And that's one of the great boons of living in this time, is having these wonderful perspectives on history and biology and cosmology. The really big picture and then the little smaller picture and you know, and finally you get down to our, our little picture. But if we could see ourselves in deep time, in biological time, we could have great hope. If we could see ourselves in the story of evolution. Because who's to say nature's going to stop with us? You think we're the best you can do? Maybe some future version of Homo sapiens sapiens, maybe Homo sapiens 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 sapiens, will look back on us as we now look back on the apes, kind of patronizingly. You know, and they'll say, gosh, in order to try to be mindful, they had to sit and break their legs and sit quietly and try to focus their, they're just naturally mindful all the time, these future beings. And maybe they'll be compassionate as well. Maybe some of them will, if we're still around, any of us, they'll study us and maybe put us in a laboratory, try to teach us to stop talking. <laughs> but what's really forgiving about seeing ourselves in the story of evolution, seeing ourselves in deep time, is the fact 
that when we look, we realize we're just a baby species. We just started out on our story. We only recently got these big brains, you know, and they didn't come with a, a good instruction manual. We're just learning how to use them. There were 100 million generations of dinosaurs. There were 10 million generations of mammals before we came along. We've only had a couple hundred thousand generations of Homo sapien, sapiens. Lao Tzu, Socrates, Buddha, 2,500 years ago, blink of a blink of an eye in biological time. Darwin, Freud, Einstein, our contemporaries, we're just beginning to understand ourselves. We're just beginning to awaken. It's very exciting. So there's hope. There is hope. And it's always good to keep in mind the big perspective, the cosmic perspective, the God perspective, the perspective that says everything is everything. Remember saying that back in the 60s? You'd be in a kind of stone conversation and <laughs> somebody would say, well, yeah, well, everything is everything, which is a real conversation stopper, you know, that's... But it's true. Everything is everything is everything is everything is everything is everything is. That's right. <clears throat> everything is subatomic particles. Everything is this, that, and the other thing. Everything is everything all and vice versa. Everything is everything for better or for worse. Everything is everything on some level anyway. Everything is just a play of shadow and light. And everything is everything, morning, noon, and night. Well, Plato said, we live in a cave of illusion. Shakespeare said, he said, this life is but a dream. And Einstein, he came to this conclusion. He said, this matter is not what it seems. Yeah, and everything is everything is everything is everything is everything is everything is. Everything is poetry and physics, say the scientists and the mystics. It's in space-time, it's just in your mind, it's what you believe. It's the dance of Shiva, the veil of Maya, the net of Indra, the robes of the prophet. It's all made out of the same cloth. It's electrical, chemical, AC and DC, and E equals MC squared. And MC squared equals E. E, 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 it's quarks, leptons, and gluons, meons, and euons, for eons and eons. Through a telescope or a microscope, it's all the same by any name. The macro and the micro, the sky above, the mud below, it's all one. And there ain't nothing new under the sun. And if you're walking on the Buddha's path, trying to get to the one, Maybe you better do your math Cause if everything is everything you already done Yeah, and everything is everything is everything is everything is everything Everything is sex, drugs, and rock and roll Body and soul, birth, death, and all the rest Everything is a metaphor for everything else Everything is the United American Amalgamated Corporation Incorporated Everything is you, you are the song, you are the universe, you are the next verse, in your my everything is everything is, everything is everything is, everything is everything is, everything is. Everything is.